trying to I'll tell you when when we get into it something that I learned that I have never connected those dots um, so and then so and then next week we'll do Judges chapter 7 and then the week after that when we do Judges chapter 8 Lisa McCurry is going to uh, help me out she's going to okay. teach uh, I'll still be here uh, but she's going to teach um, and so uh, we'll go through that so anybody got anything that you'd like to pray about today any praises that you'd like to share anything yes uh, we will always take prayers for Awanas okay. Awanas is tonight that God is faithful so that's a really good one um, and we always appreciate anybody and a lot of you do come and help so that's awesome and there's always room for more all right so let me let me highlight what Awanas and our children's ministry is doing has done is that I've got four kids who have come to me off their own backs and said I want to be baptized Ooh, can you believe that and I've talked to every single one of them and it I mean, and you ask them, you know, so tell me what Jesus has done for you. Tell me the difference that Jesus makes. And they're, they're spot on. I mean, they're, they've got it. You know, they're not doing it because their friends, you know, want to do it. And, I, you know, I've just been very impressed. And so uh, thank you to our one volunteers. Thank you to, you know, Miss Donna and Miss Sherry and all of them that are so involved in in teaching our kids because that that was such a huge blessing uh, when when they came and and you know I just my heart fills with joy you know so anything else I, I have a praise I, I struggled all summer through June July and most of August with a respiratory bug that had taken up residence in my lungs and so I give praise for God leading me to a, a wonderful pulmonologist mm -hmm. who knew what to do, and I thank God for whoever invented Trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know it, what that means, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an inhaler. Okay, all right. And it's, uh, yes, yeah, so I just praise God that people have been gifted Good. with a mind that creates that kind of, of thing. Absolutely, absolutely. I have a praise too. I fell Saturday morning and got banged up pretty badly, but so lucky that I didn't break anything. Good. So. Good. And I could get up. <laughs> no? I got a prayer request for our previous pastor, uh, his cancer. I'd like to remember him here when I first. Okay. All right. Okay. What's his first name? Yeah. Bill. Bill. <laughs> All right. All right. I said we forget. Okay. Well, let's pray together, and then uh, we're gonna we're gonna see how far we get in in these two chapters here. So, Lord, we thank you for this day that you have made, um, and as always, we give thanks for being able to come together and to uh, study your word together, and to be in relationship not only with you but with each other, and celebrate all the good things that are taking place in our lives together uh, through our con conversations uh, we we celebrate what you're doing in the lives of, of the ministry of our children here um, and I pray that you would continue to just sow those seeds uh, and I, I thank you for uh, those we've got people who are uh, going to be having surgery uh, today and tomorrow and I think of Barb and I think of how you have gifted people to take what you have given us and use those gifts and those resources to heal people even today um, and we know that science and medicine can't answer everything but we know that you uh, who created us know us better than anybody and uh, we pray for the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives uh, we give thanks for uh, even where we could have probably suffered greater um, but for whatever reason you know we didn't and we give thanks for that and we pray for Bill we pray for this this pastor who has cancer and that you would have your hand upon him 
I pray that you would surround him with encouragement, uh, that you would fill his life with and keep him focused on Jesus and not on, on cancer, um, and that he would remember as always that you have the last word in our lives. Uh, so we pray for him and we pray for his healing. Uh, we pray that you would comfort him. But I pray today as we gather here uh, that you would speak to us uh, through your word, uh, that we would learn, not just study to gain facts or knowledge, but that we would gain wisdom through studying your word that is even alive today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, all right, so last week we, uh, this is the tidbit I'm going to share with you, okay? Last week we talked about Deborah and uh, Barak, and we talked about, uh, it's, I say JL, but it's actually Yael. Um, and here, here's my tidbit. So how did, how did Yael kill Cicero. You remember? Tip peg to the head, right? Yep. Alright. <laughs> Stay with me. Um, and I, I really shouldn't do this because I'm, I'm going to be pinched on time, but I just find this fascinating. So if you go over to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, right? So he says, I, uh, God, you know, this, remember, God is dealing with the serpent and Eve and Adam, right? It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, talking to Adam, between you and your offspring and her offspring. All right, watch this. He shall bruise your head. Who's he shall bruise your head? Who is that? Jesus will bruise Satan's Satan. head, right? Mm -hmm. All right? Right? But it comes from the seed of a woman. Right? Right? Just hang on to that. So there's this thing about, you know, crushing the head of the serpent. Mine, mine says bruise, but we say crushing the head of the serpent. So Yael crushes the head of Sisera. What happened with David and Goliath? David threw a stone, hit him in the head. And then if you go over to, uh, actually this is what um, Lisa's going to be teaching on, is, is it 8? No, maybe it's 9. No, it is chapter 9. If you go over to chapter 9, verse 53, watch this. And a certain woman threw an upper millstone on Abimelech's head. So there's this theme in Scripture, you know, and it, it's an Old Testament theme, but more of a theme in Scripture that, that, you know, there's always this, the crushing of the head of the serpent or of evil. And, and so you have, I've given you three stories, Yale, David and Goliath, and Abimelech. And there's this, con but it's all foreshadowing what Jesus does on the cross is that ultimately Jesus, and we go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where he crushes the head of the serpent because of what he does. Right? Yeah. So I never connected all that. And I just find that really fascinating. You know, so that's your tidbit of information you can chew on later. So, all right. Um, let me get into uh, Judges chapter 5 here. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on it because... It, it really is a song about everything that happened in chapter um, chapter 4. Um, so, when Jews wanted to celebrate special occasions, Jewish people, man, they really expressed themselves in song. Um, and so that's why you have a lot of, you know, you have Mary's song, you have Deborah's song, you have the, you know, the Psalms, you know, those are songs... And so the, the writer of Judges shifts from telling the story to Deborah's song of singing the story. And so 
And, and if and if a poem or a song isn't something, isn't always something you can easily outline, um, because in a song or a poem, there's this spontaneous expression of things. And so, especially if you if you were to ever study Hebrew poetry, um, it, there, it contains recurring themes or stanzas to express these things. So I'm going to read verses 1 to 12, and as you see in your notes, um, the, the first thing it should say, praise the Lord, all you people. That, that really is the theme in these first 12 verses. So uh, it says, Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinam, Abinam, on that day, that the leaders took the lead in Israel, that the people offered themselves willingly. Okay, so just look at that word, willingly. Um, and there it is, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear. O princes, to the Lord I will sing. I will make melody to the Lord, the God of Israel. Lord, when you sent out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water. All right, you remember where we couldn't find where there was a torrential rainstorm, right? So, and so the mountains quaked before the Lord, even Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, uh, in the days of Yael, uh, the highways were abandoned. The travelers kept to the byways. The villagers ceased in Israel. They ceased to uh, be until I arose. This is I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. And when the new gods were chosen, then war was in the gates. Was shield or spear to be seen among the 40,000 in Israel? My heart goes out to the commanders of Israel who offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless the Lord. Tell of it. You who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, you who walk by the way to the sound of the musicians at the watering places. There they repeat the righteous triumphs of the Lord, the righteous triumphs of his villagers in Israel. Then down to the gates march the people of the Lord. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake. Break out in song. Arise, Barak. Lead away your captives, O son of Abinoah. All right. So I, I'm reading all that because... Like I say, we're going to take this in, in chunks here. Um, so in verses 1 to 9, Deborah and Barak praise the Lord for all that he did for his people. Um, and so it says there that these leaders, you know, it doesn't mention the word unity, but you feel it, that there, there are all these people that came out and they praise God for unifying, you know, at least six of the tribes to go and fight against these people. Um, and so the, the same God who gave Israel victory in the past gives Israel victory today. Um, and so Israel entered into a covenant with the Lord at Mount Sinai, um, which that's mentioned there, and he would fulfill his promises to his people. Um, since the conditions were so terrible in the land, remember the people cried out because they were terribly oppressed. And they cried out because, you know, if you go back to verse uh, chapter 4, it says there in, I think it's verse 3, that uh, Jabin, the king of Cana, he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly. And so Deborah says, you know, I arose, I'm concerned about the spiritual life of, of these people as well as their physical life and their, their political welfare. Note that in verse 2 at the beginning of this song, it, it says, bless the Lord. Some of you may have praised the Lord. 
Um, and then in, in verse 9, as she sort of ends this first sort of portion, it says there in verse 9 again, bless the Lord or praise the Lord. And so she begins and ends that section with, you know, praise be to God. And so, and according to verses 10 and 11, you know, it, you know, it says, you who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpet. So they, they called on, you know, the wealthy, the nobles, those who were affluent to join the battle. But as well, it says, you know, uh, there in verse 10, and you who walk by the way, that would have been, you know, the more common people, you know, like myself, you know. Um, they, they were calling on everybody, and everybody came to, you know, willingly to fight this fight. And so... Um, but if you go back, it says there that, um, oh, you see, back up in verse, uh, trying to think, oh, verse 6. It says, in the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Yael, the highways were abandoned. The travelers kept to the byways, the villagers, all those things that had ceased. You know, the safety of being on the road, the safety of gathering as a people. You know, now these people could come out, you know, behind walled cities and enjoy the freedoms of being out among God's creation, being together. Um, and it was time for Israel to praise God, you know, for the mercies. And so this praise standard actually closes with action there in verse 12. It says, awake, awake, Deborah. And then it says, arise, Barak. So God says to Deborah, it's time to wake up and, 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 to, and to sing. And then he says to Barak, it's time to arise and, and to wake up and to go attack the enemy. And, it, and it's because of Deborah's faith. Not Barracks, but because of Deborah's faith that this song can be sung. And so, uh, before the battle started, you know, she had the faith that God was going to do what he promised. And now she sings because of what God kept his promise. Um, let me read verses 13 to 18 here. Um, and in your notes it says, these are, this is the praise for volun volunteers, those who willingly served. It says, then down marched the remnant of the noble. There's your root. Um, the people of the Lord marched down for me against the mighty. For Ephraim, their root, they marched down into the valley following you, Benjamin, with your kinsmen. From uh, Bekir, uh, march down the commanders. From Zebulun, um, those who bear the lieutenant's staff. The princes of Issachar came with Deborah, and Issachar faithful to Barak. Into the valley they rushed at his heels. Among the clans of Reuben, um, there were great searchings of the heart. Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the whistling for the flocks? Among the clans of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan, and Dan, why did he stay with the ships? Asher sat still at the coast of the sea, staying by his landing. Zebulun is a people who risked their lives to death. Nephtali, too on the heights of the field. So there's a balance here. There are those who get praise for coming, and there's criticism of those who said, eh, we're just going to hang back, right? So Deborah was grateful for the people who offered themselves willingly, and I use that word. Because they didn't have to come, as we see, you know, from people like Dan and Reuben. You know, they, they didn't go. And so, uh, 
six tribes united in sending people except for the people and we'll get to this down in verse 23 curse Miraz right and we'll get to that it's a bit of a backhanded slap to bear it because they are a town within the tribe of Neftali and so the phrase in verse 14 those who bear the the lieutenant staff uh, it actually probably refers to uh, as as the recruiting officers would get people who would come in they would take note of their names so they would not be forgotten um, and so there were four tribes that really didn't volunteer the tribe of Reuben it, in, and it says there um, among Reuben there were great searchings of heart in other words we thought about it <coughs> but we decided not to and so, and then you've got Manasseh in the east, uh, which would be Gilead. You know, they were safe on the other side of Jordan. You know, they were like, you know, it's not our fight. You know, we'll, we'll stay over here. And so they, that, that was verse 17. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. Dan and Asher were on the coast. They also elected to not heed the call. And so in contrast, you've got tribes like Zebulun and Naphtali that are especially praised for risking their lives there in verse 18. Now keep in mind, during this period, remember, and I'll just I'll go back to it, and, and it just continues to bring to the forefront the last verse of Judges which said, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. All right? So they, they all chose what they wanted to do. Had you been under Joshua's command, Joshua would have said, uh, we're all going in together. But not so anymore. Because there's no true leader in Israel. And so... You know, the people of God are, you know, even today, are not unlike the people of Israel when it comes to service. You know, some immediately respond to the call. And some people go, ah, there's a football game on today. I think I'll just stay home or, you know, play it safe. You know, um, and some people, you know, they think about it. They pray about it. You know, like like Reuben did, you know, there, there were, was great searchings of heart, but in the end they decided not to go. And we have people like that today. And so, uh, you know, I'm gonna, let me sort of keep going here. Um, let me read verses 19 to 23. It says, the kings came, they fought, and then fought the kings of Canaan at Tanakh, uh, by the waters of Megiddo. Um, they got no spoils of silver. From heaven the stars fought. From their courses they fought against Sisera. The torrent, Kishon, swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent, Kishon. March on, my soul, with mine. Then loud beat the horse hooves, with the galloping, galloping of his steeds. Curse Miraz, says the angel of the Lord. Curse its inhabitants thoroughly, because they did not come to help, uh, to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. All right. Um, it, it's, it's one thing to show up for duty. It's quite another when you get ready to go into battle, right? I've never been in the military. But there's a difference between being in boot camp and going off to war. And so um, Sisera organized uh, these armies, you know, uh, in an alliance with other Canaanite kings. And, and as we looked back, you know, there were, they had all these men, and it made a point of 900 iron chariots. And so the, the Jews and the Jewish army and Sisera come to the place at Megiddo, Megadu, um, and since remember 
last week we talked about it was the dry season. No one was expecting, you know, we've got a clear battlefield. We've got a clear game plan. We've got chariots. We can do this. And then the rains came. You know, God, God trumped the weather person that day. <laughs> And brought the rain, and the chariots got stuck and made it hard to fight. And so this this torrential rainstorm, you know, swamp this battlefield turns into a swamp, and, and the army of Israel that trusted the Lord to give them victory got exactly what God promised. And so Deborah and Barak notice that she doesn't curse Miraz, it says. You know, curse Miraz says the angel of the Lord, and so uh, when you, it, it's a little embarrassing. And I read this in a commentary. Barack, Barack, Barrett. You know, being from Neftali, you know, to have somebody in his own tribe not respond to the call that he was leading. Um, for this important battle must have hurt for him. And note that what they're criticized for isn't simply that they failed to show up. It says because they did not come to the help of the Lord. That's different. You know, if you read Reuben, they were great searching, you know, uh, and Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan, but Miraz, it says they they didn't come. They didn't come to the help of the Lord, so that's why they're cursed. Um, all right, let me let me finish this out, and then we're going to pause, and then I'll, we'll jump into chapter six, um, verse twenty-four. Most blessed of women be Yael, the wife of Heber the Canaanite. Uh, the Kenite, sorry, um, of tent-dwelling women most blessed. He asked for water. She gave him some milk. She brought him some curds in a noble's bowl. She sent her hand to the tent peg and her right hand to the workman's mallet, and she struck Sisera. She crushed his head. Um, she shattered and pierced his temple. And between her feet, he sank, he fell, he lay still. Between her feet he sank, he fell. And where he sank, there he fell, dead. Out of the window she peered, the mother of Sisera, wailed through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of the chariots? Her wisest princesses answer. Indeed, she answers herself. Have they not found and divided the spoil? A womb uh, or two for every man. Spoil of dyed materials for Sisera. Spoil of dyed materials embroidered. Two pieces of dyed work embroidered for the neck as spoil. So may all your enemies perish, O Lord. But your friends be like the sun as he rises in his might. And the land had rest for four years. So, the, the thing I love there, it says, most blessed of women. Did anybody, can anybody connect the dots there? Where do you hear that? Mary. In Mary. That's right. And so, you know, Barak, because he hesitates, Deborah says, because of your hesitation, essentially, Sisera is going to be given into the hand of of a woman. That's who's going to kill him. And it won't be you. So that when, with one stroke, Yael sent the tent peg through his temple and shattered his head and, and killed him. And so Deborah moves from describing Sisera's death there, um, and it, you get there in verse 28, she moves to the widow. Or not the widow, the the mother. What, and you know, I had to pause there for a second. Because, you know, to imagine a mother who thought, 
My son should be on his way home, but he's not. And what that must have felt like. Sister was dead and, and was never going to come home to his mother's love again. And, and, and his mother and her attendants kept telling themselves that everything's fine. I mean, it talks about, oh, the spoils, oh, the spoils. But things weren't fine. And then you have this closing prayer in verse 31. And it contrasts the enemies of the Lord who, uh, it, it says, may all your enemies perish. In other words, may all your enemies be like Sisera and die. And so the contrast is that those who love God, those who, they're like the noonday sun, that they will rise again. And so... The battle at Medigo, uh, I keep saying Medigo, Megiddo, uh, was more than just a conflict between two opposing armies. Uh, it was a conflict really between good and evil, as was in anything in the Bible. And so you either love Christ and walk in the light, or you are like the enemy and you perish in the darkness. That's, that's the story of the Bible in the end. And so this is simply a foreshadowing of, or, or a small snapshot of the bigger picture. All right. Anybody got any thoughts? Any questions? They seem to make such a, you know, a big deal out of a woman killing the, the bad guy is it does it does it is it less um I can't think of how to phrase it is there some uh thing that says that it's worse to be killed by a man a woman than a man so there's you it's less honorable yeah do you remember last week um who was that i need to go back um who was the guy we talked about this last week. Was it Abimelech? Who would... Oh. <laughs> no, he begged the guy. He said, you know, kill me. Oh, yeah. Lest a woman yeah. Yeah. kills me. And so it was, you know, it's one thing to die in battle. It's another thing, you know, to, to die... It's a whole nother thing to die by a woman's hand. It's more shameful. Y yes. That's the word I was looking for. Unexpected. Yes. Yeah. And so, yeah. <clears throat> Anybody else? You have to wonder, looking at Hebrew poetry and thinking about the Psalms, the songs of the Hebrew nation were sung as they traveled sure. or while they worked and that's how the history of course of the Jewish nation was passed down generation to generation you have to wonder the circumstances that Deborah's song was then sung you know we have one instance of it where it's introductory but it carried throughout the nation for as long as they could remember. It would be interesting to hear it recorded, do you know what I mean? Oh, true. Yeah. I mean, we read it, but right. imagine what it's like to actually sing it. Yeah. What I find odd is that so many um, denominations don't let women have any part of being a Presbyterian, an elder or sure. or whatever. And in the Bible, the women were very active. They were very active. I mean, I don't know how, where the, those denominations get there. <laughs> it, there's a place in Corinthians that they hinge everything on. on. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You're stirring the pot, Jane. You know. Uh, <laughs> No, no, you're, you're, I'm joking, I'm joking. Well, no, I mean, hey, that's okay. And let's be fair. I mean, you know, it's, um, 
you know, and it wasn't the men that were at the empty tomb first. That's right. It was women. It was women. And and God, you know, you know, as Jesus ministered, women were such an important part of, of the ministry. The and even when Paul the was ministering. Church, the Philippian church was started by women. It's so, obedience, not gender. But it, it's, you know, we, and a lot of what we read, um, it is God's word, but it's honest. And what it says is that you're in a male-dominated society, you know, that is led with men that, you know, but through God's word, God says, you know, let me show you the importance here, though. Jesus turned the, the whole cultural thing upside down, you know. But I'm not going to get into all that because we'll get to, uh, get to <laughs> preaching. So, all right. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. But Reuben stayed behind when they ran in battle this time. That's right. And that, that's the difference with Joshua because, you know, again, they had a true leader and and he said, You can stay, but you're going to fight with us because this was promised to all of us, but you opted out. <clears throat> you know. And in Judges, again, the last verse tells you everything you want to know. All right, let me let me get into chapter six here. Um, so, let, how how many people here you know have or had had gardens where you went out and you planted tomatoes or whatever? You know, um, did you, did you ever did you ever have vermin come in and destroy those things? You remember that? And you come out and you're expecting, oh, I'm going to have such a great, you know. And, you know, all of a sudden, it's, it's been destroyed, you know. Um, That's why I only had one garden. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, the reason I ask that question is because this is what was happening every year on an annual basis with Israel in this next chapter. The, uh, the Midianites would uh, come in and take all the harvest from Israel and then they would leave and Israel had no means necessarily to fight and so they would let this happen and then they had they had all the scraps left over and so they would do things like hide food and you know such and so this goes on year after year and there's nothing really that they can do about it and so for seven years, God allows the Midianites and their, their allies to destroy the, the so-called land of milk and honey, you know, for the Israelites. And they leave the people in, in poverty pretty much. And so about the eighth uh, year, the Midi when the Midianites would come to invade, God calls a man from Manasseh, and his name is Gideon. He's a farmer. Um, and yet... God raises up this farmer to become a deliverer. Now, you you remember, um, was it Shamgar, you know, um, was it Shamgar? Who is it that had the uh, ox goat? Ehud. Was it Ehud? I can't remember now. It's, I've slept since then. But remember, he was a farmer, and he had that one stick, that ox goat, where on one end it would pick off the, the dirt off the plow and on the, you know, and yeah, so he would, he took that, you know, God raised up this farmer. And so what you're going to see here is in, in chapter 6, we're faced with a guy who is scared to death of, you know, is this for real? You're calling me, you know. And then in chapter 7 and part of chapter 8, we find that this same guy is, becomes a conqueror, not a coward. 
And then towards the end of chapter 8, we find that this guy who went from being a, a farmer to a warrior becomes, he compromises his values. It's interesting. Um, and so, but this space, this devoted to Gideon, is there are 100 verses on him. The most given to any judge in the Bible. Uh, in the book. And so um, Gideon honestly is a great encouragement to, to anyone or should be because if you have a hard time accepting yourself and believing that God can't do anything with you, this is one of those stories that, you know, he raises this guy up and confronts, you know, him and, and works in him. And we see, you know, there are moments in the Old Testament where the Spirit of the Lord came upon somebody. And this is one of those people. And so, but before God could ever use Gideon, um, he had to deal with some doubts. And so we're going to look at four doubts that Gideon has that were sort of obstacles to his faith. Um, Alright, so the first one is, does God really care about us? Talk about Israel, right? Um, so let me let me read verses uh, one to thirteen here. Uh, need to be in the right chapter. Okay, there we go. Um, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And there should be a word there again, but uh, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian for seven years, and the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves dens that are in the mountains and caves and the stronghold and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and uh, the people of the east would come against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza, and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents, and they would come like locusts in numbers. Both they and their camels could not be counted, so that they would lay waste to the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of the Lord cried out uh, for help to the Lord. And when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God, and you shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Okay. Now, that's right, again. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat underneath the terebinth at Ophrah, and which belonged to Joash the Abizrite. Um, and while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress, there you go, to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Some of you may have, O mighty warrior or hero. Um, and Gideon said, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt, up out of Egypt? Um, but now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of men. All right. So, the, you know, there's that. The Lord has forsaken us. You know, um, that was Gideon's response to seeing an angel. And so... And yet, the Lord has shown up. You know, he's heard his people cry out. He shows up, and Gideon says, don't you care? I mean, if you're with us, 
Why is all this happening? And so God says, the reason all this is happening is because you've not done what I asked. You've not obeyed my voice. And so in verses 1 to 6, he has to discipline them. He says, you know, I did all these great things. Um, you know, you, we can't conceive of a holy God that wants anything less than his very best for his children. And, and the best that he can give us is a holy character like that of Jesus Christ. And so obedience to the Lord builds character. And, and But sin destroys character. And God says, I cannot sit by and just watch all this happen and watch my children just destroy themselves. I'm going to have to do something. And so Israel, they'd already experienced about 43 years of suffering under the rule of, of neighboring nations. And yet, they've not learned their lesson. And so they turn away from God and turn to idols. And so, listen, unless suffering leads to repentance, it accomplishes nothing. Mm -hmm. And so our repentance should be evidence of our desire to turn from sin to God, not simply to escape pain. Now notice something, and we had this before, Israel, they cry out to the Lord because they're in pain. There's nothing in here that says they've repented. Mm -hmm. They're just oppressed, and they want to stop suffering. And so discipline mm -hmm. assures us that we are truly God's children. The New Testament talks about that. Proverbs talks about that. Uh, that discipline is a part of the Father's love. Uh, we cannot simply just get away with doing whatever we want. And so the Midianites, they had organized this coalition of, of different groups to invade the land, you know, every year. And all Israel could do was, was run away. They would flee to the mountains and the hills and, and hide in the caves and the dens. And so when the Jews would return home, all they found was devastation. There was no crops. There were no animals. There was nothing for them. And so, and this happened year after year. So, in verses 7 to 10, God, God sort of, he reprimands his people. Um, previous to this, the angel of the Lord, uh, when it says angel of the Lord, probably pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, okay? Probably. Um, had come to Bochim, and back in chapter 2, the angel of the Lord shows up and, and, and gives a, a good stern talking to some people, right? So he's, he's here uh, to sort of do the same thing, um, and, and so now this, this unnamed prophet that it just says angel of the Lord comes to repeat the same message he repeated back in chapter 2. You've not learned your lesson. And so often when you're going through the Old Testament, the Lord would confront his people for disobedience. But in the same token, you notice that there's a chunk here where he reminds them of, look, I brought you out of Egypt. I, you know, I mean, it doesn't say this here, but on other account, I parted the Red Sea. I did all these things for you because I love you. And so I, I helped you to overcome your enemies. And, and if the Jews were suffering from, from the state that they were in, quite honestly, that's not God's fault. So that when, when Gideon says, well, if the Lord is with us, why is all this happening? It's almost like God's falling down on the job. <laughs> no, the people fell down on the job. They weren't doing what God had asked. God had given them everything they needed. Now, if you read through the New Testament epistles, 
you can't help but notice that the, the apostles, they take the same approach. They talk about all the things that God did and, and you know, you're here because you made some bad choices. But God loves you because look at all the things that he did for his people. And so, as God's children, we are to walk worthy of our high calling uh, and live like people who are, are, are followers of Jesus Christ. And so, the motive for Christian living is that we gain something um, that we don't have, but that we would live up to what we already have in Christ. So the purpose of disciplining is, is to make God's children willing to listen to God's word. God is, is trying to speak to his children. And he either does that in two ways. He either speaks through in a loving voice through his scripture or through discipline. And so one way or the other, the Lord is going to get our attention in one of those ways. Let me, there in verses 11 to 13 that we read, um, the people were crying out to the Lord for help. Um, look, that's not unusual, you know. Um, the Israelites, but again, there's no evidence that they repented. And so, uh, but I think God responded. If you go over to Isaiah chapter 63, verse 9, there, there's a great path. It says, in all their afflictions, he was afflicted. Right? There's, there's a great phrase. In other words, I think God sees his people suffering, and he's hurting too. And so he responds. God, in his mercy, doesn't give us what we deserve. And in his grace, he gives us what we don't deserve. And so when you consider the, the kind of man that Gideon is at this time, you sort of look and go, why would God choose somebody like that? You know? And so, but God often chooses the not normal things or people to accomplish things in order to get all the credit. Right? He, you looks, know? he looks within. That's right. Or and so, uh, interestingly enough, Gideon's family serves the gods of the Baal. Um, and so, but there's no evidence that he does. And, and we'll get to that here in a second. Uh, and so, he may have, you know, we, we're going to get down here. Um, let me, actually, let me read... Let me read 14 to 24. Um, and let me just say that Gideon's response, you know, when, when the angel of the Lord comes and says, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And then he questions that. That really is saying, you know, I have a lack of faith in in who you say that I am. Right? So let me let me read verses 14 here to 24. Um, just keeping an eye on my time. Um, and the Lord turned to him and said, Go, in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian, do I not send with you? Uh, and he said to him, Please, Lord, Here's another question. How can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to himself, If I now find if now I have found favor in your eyes show me a sign that it is you who speaks with me 
Please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And, and he said, I will stay until you return. So Gideon went into his house, prepared a young goat and 11 cakes uh, from an ephah of flour. Uh, the meat he put in a basket and the broth he put in a pot and he brought them uh, to him underneath the terebinth and presented them. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out uh, the tip of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. And fire sprang up from the rock and consumed all the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord uh, vanished from his sight. Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the, the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear. Uh, you shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it still stands in Ophrah. Um, and belongs to the uh, Abyssalites. Uh, Abyssalites. Sorry. All right. So Gideon's first response was, you know, uh, Lord, if you're with us, you know, why is all this happening? And then he questions God's wisdom in choosing him. Right. Moses sort of does the same thing. This isn't a new. This isn't new. You know, everybody has doubts. You know, we all have doubts when God says, I choose you. Really? Why? You know, we all do that. Uh, so then you have the Lord's statements. They're recorded in verses 12 and 14. Um, you know, that he, he says, look, I'm, I'm going to give you everything that you need. Just, I'm going to be with you. I just need you to do what I've asked you to do. And so... Um, you know, once God calls and commissions us, all we have to do is obey. That's all we got to do. Um, and He'll do the rest. Sharon, you're laughing. You know, all we got to do is obey. All we got to do is obey. God can't lie. That's the thing. He can't lie. And He never fails. So faith means obeying God in spite of what we see, how we feel about ourselves, or, or what the circumstances are. Um, and so Gideon's statement there, when he says, um, Behold, my clan is the weakest. I am the least in my father's house. So that may mean that uh, weakest may mean the poorest. You know, the smallest. or the smallest, right? They probably have the least, which is sort of hard to believe because when we get over here in a second uh, actually he takes ten servants so he must not be that poor you know um, but you know in any event Gideon seems to think that God what can you do with, with me and I'm the least in my family now the reason for that may be because the rest of his family serves and worships the gods of Baal. But he's chosen not to, so they look down on him. That's why he feels like he's the least in his family, probably. So when you review God's gracious promises, you wonder, you know, why why is he wavering? Why is he hesitating? And God says, I promise to be with you. The angel of the Lord says, mighty man of valor, mighty warrior. You know, and promise that I'm going to use you to save Israel from the Midianites, you know, and you're going to destroy them as one man. You know, but Gideon, for whatever reason, can't receive this word. And he constantly needs assurance. And so Gideon asks for a sign. He, he says, he's talking with the Lord. The Lord's very gracious, very patient with Gideon's self-doubt um, and so Gideon prepares a sacrifice which was costly I mean read what he read what he he gets 
he gets uh, a young goat, some unleavened cakes, and the ephah of flour. Remember the circumstances they're in. So this is costly. And so um, food is scarce. So God in his patience, he says, I'll be back. And God says, I'll wait on you. You know. Um, so he puts it on the rock. The fire, the appearance of fire all of a sudden and, and consumes it and it, it affirms that this visitor is who Gideon thinks that he is. The Lord. Interestingly enough, is that now we go from is this the person? And the fire consumes, right? Watch this. For now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Now you read that and you think, wow, what an awesome event. Gideon, Jews believe if they came face to face with the angel of the Lord, they'd die. Mm -hmm. And so now Gideon is going, I've just been face to face with him, now I'm going to die. <laughs> and so God has to reassure him there in the next, he says, peace be with you, do not fear, you shall not die. So he's constantly having to reassure Gideon. It's, it's, if you don't read it and you don't understand, it's a comical thing. I mean, this guy is, everything is, he's scared to death. And so God gives Gideon this message of peace and prepares him for war. And so, you know, and honestly, unless you're at peace with God, you can't face any enemy that comes your way. And so, it's customary for Jews to identify special events and places and put up monuments in order to remember these things. And so Gideon builds an altar and calls it the Lord is peace, the shalom. The problem for us as Westerners in understanding shalom is the fact that it means so much more than the end of hostility. It's, it, shalom is really about your spiritual well-being, your physical health, prosperity. It's, it's so much more than just what we think of as peace. It, it's talking about an inner peace, a wholeness. Gideon says now, I've seen the Lord. I believe he can use me, um, not because of who he was, but because of who God is. And now remember this, God never calls you to a task that is based on your ability. He calls you to a task that's based on his ability. Um, all right, so I tell you what. Let me do one more. Oh, Let me do one more section, and and then and then we'll stop, and then we'll do the rest of chapter six and chapter seven next week. Is that good? And you're buying lunch, right? All right. What's that? And you're buying lunch, right? Right there. <laughs> I made it. Right there. You want those hotcakes? <laughs> um. All right. So, verse twenty-five. That night the Lord said to Gideon, to him, um, Take your father's bull, and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has. Cut down the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold here, with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering, with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men of his servants. That, that's why he's probably not as poor as we think he is. Um, and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family, here we go, and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. 
When the men of the town rose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down and the Asherah beside it. It was cut down and the second bull was offered on the altar that had been built. And they said to one another, Who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the men of the town said to Joash, Bring out your son, that he may die. For he has broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah beside him. But Joash said, now watch this, this is so interesting. But Joash said to all those who stood, Will you contend for Baal, or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a god, talking about Baal, let him contend for himself, because his altar has been broken down. Therefore, on that day, Gideon was called Jerubal, um, and that is to say, let Baal contend for himself, because he has broken down his altar. All right, let's, let's stop there, and then we'll pick back up. Um, man, what, what kind of day must you have? Um, <laughs> So, now remember, I told you that Gideon's family worshipped Baal, uh, and so if he challenged, this is, a, this is one of those things that God says, all right, let's start small. I'm a, you're going to have to fight an army. Let's, let's start small. And I'm going to give you a task right in your own backyard that has to do with your family because, you know, if you, if you can't keep your family in order, you, you're not going to keep anything else in order. Sort of, so to speak, and so, um, I, I, you know, Gideon still being afraid, God says, "I want you to take a stand in your own village, in your own house, before you face the enemy on the battlefield." So, uh, you know, the assignment isn't an easy one. I'm, I'm just going to be fair. It's not an easy one. God says, destroy the altar dedicated to Baal. Build an altar to the Lord. I want you to sacrifice the, 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 the bulls using the Asherah pole for fuel. In other words, I want you to tear it down, and then I want you to take that, that wooden pole, and I want you to cut it up, and I want you to burn it. And so Jewish altars were made of uncut stones and, and were very simple. Baal's altars apparently were very elaborate and next to them was always a wooden pillar dedicated to the goddess Asherah. That's why it's called an Asherah pole. Um, and so since the altars were built in high places um, you know typically depending on where the town was you could look up and see it. So he didn't want to do it by day because everybody could lay eyes on, on that particular location. And so he did it by night. And so Gideon goes and he wasn't sure if, if God could see him because he did it by night, but obviously he could. Um, after all the encouragements that God has given him, you know, Gideon's faith should have been strong enough, but but before we judge, or I judge Gideon too much, you know, ask your ask yourself, you know, how much do you trust the Lord? You know, so Gideon privately built an altar to the Lord. You know, there in verses 20, 24, he built an altar. He built it all by himself. Now he's got to take a public stand. And so he gathers ten men, and you know that if, if everybody in town's wondering who, who did it, one of the ten must have said something. Okay? And so the men of the city, they come, they, they, it's a capital offense what, what Gideon's done. And so no doubt they're wondering, you know, uh, Gideon's wondering what's going to happen to me. And yet God proves himself to handle the situation. <clears throat> Joash, Gideon's father, had every reason to be angry with his son but in, in, because he smashes the altar of the God that he worships. However, God must have been at work in Joash's heart. 
And so he defends Gideon. In fact, it, it's it's actually, I'm not going to say comical, but he's, he seems very sarcastic when he does this. They come and they want to put Gideon to death. And, and, and essentially, Joash says, if, if Baal is such a great God, let him defend himself. Let him deal with my son. And the same thing actually happens in, in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 27. In Elijah, he takes the same approach, you know, when he says, what, what kind of God, you know, can, can't plead his own case, you know, sort of thing. And so, um, and then they give Gideon a nickname. Jerubal, right? And and it's actually it, according to what Joash says is let Baal contend for himself. In other words, if he's such a great God, let him deal with it himself. And so a lot of times we give people nicknames sometimes not for good reasons. Sometimes we give them to honor them. And so in a, in a sort of way Gideon is being honored by God because he gets this nickname. Gideon learned a very valuable lesson. If you obey the Lord more than you obey your fear, the Lord will do great things. And he shows him that. Now, I'm going to stop there, and we'll pick up uh, in verse 33. Okay? Move my little thing on. Okay. I'm going to highlight this so that I know where we're at. Um, all right. Anybody got any thoughts? Any questions? I know I did pretty much all the talking today. So, um, but we'll pick up, finish up the story, and then we'll finish the rest of Gideon's story. Uh, well, we'll get. No, we'll, we'll get to most of it. So, and then Lisa will, will finish it out the next week. Is everybody good? Yes, sir. Yeah, but there's a little phrase in verse 26 which is really easy to skip over. But I think it's important for all people at all times. Sure. That is when you do the Lord's work, you do it carefully. You do it to the best of your ability. Yeah. So, and the stones were laid in due order. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Anybody else? Thank you for being patient and hanging with me. Uh, I just knew that if we did chapter 5, you'd be out in 30 minutes. So, uh, Let me pray for us. So, Lord, we thank you for the story of Deborah and Yael. We thank you for the story of Gideon. Uh, I pray that each and every one of us would come willingly and say, Lord, what would you have me do? Lord, what do you need me to do? How can I serve you? Rather than us coming and saying, you know, Lord... Here's what I need you to do to serve me. Um, and I pray that we would not let our fears uh, dictate our faith. But may the God that we serve have the, the greater word over our fears and that we would trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right.